Kimetsu no Yaiba, uh, Demon Slayer, an anime which saw its first season air through the spring and summer seasons of 2019, itself an adaptation of a manga which ran from January 2019 to conclusion in May of 2020, was something I was predestined to enjoy. Its emphasis on Kenjutsu, Japanese folklore, and that it takes place during the Taisho era, one of the most underrepresented periods in popular visual media, meant that it would have to try very, very hard to disappoint me. And maybe one day, I'll talk about what Toji no Miko Katana Maidens did to hurt me. Um, wh where was I? Yeah, Kimetsu no Yaiba was great. The first season, spanning 26 episodes, covers a lot of plot and a lot of wonderfully animated fight sequences within. This is a series which is an incredibly rich source of popular and heavily stylized sword-based combat, and so I felt it best to narrow the focus down because otherwise this could turn into a rambling mass. The focus of this video will be on the second and third episodes of Season 1, so mild spoilers ahead. For those of you who haven't seen the first season, these episodes cover the formative period in the life of any aspiring shonen protagonist, his first training montage. Except, this isn't a montage, but, well, I'll be getting to that. Part 1. Tengu One of the fascinating aspects of Koryubudo, that is to say, traditional Japanese martial arts, is that many buge ryuha or martial arts schools trace their founding to supernatural beings. In the category of creatures of Japanese folklore, none are more overtly associated with kenjutsu, that is, Japanese sword arts, than the tengu. Just what a tengu is, however, is largely dependent on the historic context which is being referenced. The oldest attribution in Japanese for Tengu is actually a borrowing from the Chinese Tiangao, which was in reference to the observation of a comet forecasting ill omens, but is elsewhere referred to as a winged cat which dwells in the mountains. In the 12th century, Tengu had advanced from simple wild beasts to humanoid figures with avian features, representations of evil who exist primarily to harass and beguile Buddhist monks. Many of the most famous Tengu were actually believed to be Buddhist monks who became enamored with their own greatness or teachings rather than the way, and so when they died, they were not reborn into the pure land, but the realm of Tengu. By the 14th century, the traditional form of the Tengu had taken shape and some relative uniformity could be observed. A mostly humanoid figure, typically wearing robes, distinguishable for varying degrees of avian features, most commonly wings protruding from the back, but they could also have talons. Also notable were their faces, very red and with a long protuberance of a nose. One of the subtle aspects about this appearance, which is observable in some folkloric accounts, was that older, more important Tengu tended to have noticeably smaller noses and far less avian features, a sign that they were reverting back to their uncorrupted former selves. Why is this small bit of folklore relevant to sword fighting? Well, if you've seen episodes 2 or 3, or even glanced at the thumbnail for this video, it should be very obvious. A Tanjiro's Kenjutsu instructor, the one who sets him on the path to becoming a demon slayer, Orokodaki Sakonji wears the mask of a Tengu. Why? Well, there is a surface level answer, and one which goes a bit deeper. In an interview for the website Manga Plus, Tetsuhiko Kadiyama, the editor who oversaw the creation and launch of Kimetsu no Yaiba, was asked if there were any notable interactions during the creation of the series with mangaka Gotoge Koyoharu. Kadiyama replied with an explanation about why Orokodaki was given the mask. He personally found his face too plain. Gotoge couldn't come up with anything to make it more interesting, 
so he covered it up. In universe, the reason given is that Orokodaki's face was far too gentle and he wasn't appropriately feared by the demons he was hunting. So he adopted a visage which would unsettle the demons, that of a Tengu. Now, without any definitive source for where Gotoge-sensei directly states why he specifically chose a Tengu mask, the next part is speculation. It is of course wholly possible that he simply felt that Tengu were cool or unsettling, and so made the design choice based on that alone. I will make a case, however, that the choice of a Tengu was deliberate and made, if not with an overt reference to, then at least with the cultural relationship between Tengu and Japanese sword arts firmly in the back of his mind. One of the earliest historic narratives about a swordsman, and warrior, of renown being trained in martial arts by Tengu is found in an account of the youth of Minamoto Yoshitsune, general and hero of the Genpei War. As the story goes, the young Yoshitsune would sneak away at night to Mount Kurama and learn from the great Konoha Tengu, the more human-like Tengu I mentioned earlier, named Sojobo. It is also worth noting that several extant Buge Ryuha also have scrolls and other documents purported to be based on founders or subsequent Iemoto, that is, headmasters, own personal experiences with Tengu. One such example is the Tengu Sho scroll of the Kashima Shinryu, purportedly written by the founder of the school, Matsumoto Baizen no Kami, in the latter part of the 15th century. One of the more popular texts, which is also available to Western readers, was written by Chojanshi Yisei, Tengu Geijutsudan, translated into English by William Scott Wilson as The Demon's Sermon on the Martial Arts. Already you can see the creative license Wilson is known for, albeit I suspect the good people at Shambhala's marketing department had a hand in the wording of the title. Despite their malefic or corrupted nature, demon isn't the best folkloric cognate for Tengu. Still, for a lot of Western readers who aren't familiar with Japanese folklore in general, and Tengu specifically, I can understand the immediate appeal of seeking a book about a demon, giving a sermon of all things, on the martial arts. There is an element of subversion and the occult which insinuates that this isn't a book that anyone would want you to read, but for that reason alone, you must. Analysis of book titles aside, the Tengu Geijutsudan is basically what the title states. The basic structure of the narrative involves Chozanshi relating the story of a swordsman who traveled to Mount Kurama to train in the art of the sword. One dark and stormy night, he encounters a group of Tengu who begin to instruct him in the martial ways. The majority of the sermon, however, comes from one Tengu in particular. Although he is never named, the insinuation based on his appearance and location is that he is none other than the Konoha Tengu who trained Minamoto Yoshitsune, Sojobo. The text is Latin with Neo-Confucian, Taoist, and the occasional drip of Zen Buddhist practice and philosophy, intellectually right at home for a text published in 1727. I mention all of this to emphasize the tradition of Japanese sword fighters seeking out the most remote, perilous, and often sacred places they can find to engage in ascetic conditioning, typically high in the mountains and encountering the denizens of these lofty heights. Tengu It is worth mentioning that Tengu are far from the only folkloric figures who have imparted knowledge to humans about the secrets of martial arts. For example, many stories about the creation of Buge Ryuha tell of their founders receiving a prophetic dream as a blessing from the kami. These experiences or dreams typically give the founder some great insight or vision about the nature of combat, and so the systems they go on to found typically center themselves and their teaching methods on these divinely inspired principles. And so, it is to the transmission of these principles which we'll turn our attention next. Part 2. Endurance Tanjiro is sent by the demon slayer Tomioka Gyu to seek out Mount Sagadi and train to become a member of the demon slayer corps 
as part of his ultimate aim of restoring the humanity of his sister, Nezuko. After reaching the mountain, the pair are attacked by a demon who they are able to subdue, but not kill. This is when Rokodaki first appears, and when he makes his initial judgment of Tanjiro, not being suited to the life of a demon slayer. And nevertheless, as a favor to Gyu, the old man begins the first of many tests to determine Tanjiro's suitability as a demon slayer candidate. Running! Now, based on the core technique of what allows a normal human to be able to fight against demons, which will be discussed below, the basic cardiovascular fitness which would be required to be able to perform it at even a basic level entails that Tanjiro ought to be able to chase after Urokodaki while carrying Nezuko on his back without stopping or collapsing from exhaustion. As it turns out though, this was just a precursor to the real test. Once Tanjiro arrives at Urokodaki's hut, he is informed that the true test will be to ascend Mount Sagiti. He slowly ascends the mountain with Rokodaki in silence, commenting to himself how exhausted he is from the initial run to the hut. Then, out of the blue, Orokodaki informs him that this isn't even the real test. Orokodaki tells Tanjiro that he has to descend down the mountain before dawn, and promptly disappears. Now, Tanjiro, as it happens, has a particularly keen sense of smell, and so finds the route down fairly easily. Except, surprise, the entire mountainside has been covered in traps, and each moment Tanjiro was delayed by being pelted, whipped, or falling into a pit is one less he has to spend to get to the bottom. Our boy Tanjiro, being the plucky young shonen protagonist he is, perseveres through adapting his unique sense of smell to sniff out the traps, and through sheer force of will. He makes it back to Orokodaki's hut just before sunrise. He is accepted as Rokodaki's student, and the second episode ends. It's really interesting that the real test is the descent from the mountain. Traditionally, the rigors involved in traversing up to a more secluded realm in order to prove one's worth and receive the special knowledge of the martial arts, which could be imparted from a creature like Tengu, was test enough. It's clever in its totality, and as we will come to understand, this regimen of ascension and descension forms the core of Tanjiro's training. Shonen really love to emphasize the idea of physical endurance. Like, it's the narrative workhorse of at least 75% of shonen mangaka. Uh, very often, their protagonist doesn't succeed because they are the strongest or the most skilled, but because they can endure the beating they will take and push past whatever limitations they have to break through to the next level. In sword arts, on the other hand, in combat involving a weapon which is capable of inflicting instantly fatal wounds, removing limbs, or disabling a combatant, the idea of enduring damage has little practical value. Instead, the idea of endurance refers to the aerobic, that is cardiovascular, and anaerobic, that is muscular, stamina, which will enable one to effectively wield the sword for a longer period of time, and where we will turn our attention to next. Part 3. Sword One of the interesting things about the manner in which Tanjiro receives his training is that once he is able to navigate the mountain with minimal difficulty, it is then that Urokodaki gives him a sword. Typically, in the vast majority of Kenjutsu Ryuha, or schools, students train with wooden swords called Bokuto, or more commonly in the West, Boken. Fundamentally, this was done for one reason. It costs less. Each Ryuha having to equip every student with a steel blade, which would then be used in continuous paired drills, resulting in chipped, damaged, and otherwise broken blades, would have been prohibitively expensive. Thus, a bokuto was much more cost-effective, as it would last longer. Thus, the fact that Tanjiro is given a steel sword instead of a bokuto indicates the kind of practice he is going to perform will not be the traditional paired drills, but rather, solo kata. This pedagogy is not typical of most kenjutsu schools, 
but is the most common method of practicing Aido. So, if this video was about Zenitsu, this would be expected. That it isn't is, I will argue, for narrative purposes which I'll be discussing in part 7. The second curious element of Tanjiro's learning to use a sword is that with the exception of the very brief demonstration of Tamashigiri, for our purposes, using rolled and damp tatami mats as a cutting medium, Orokodaki is never shown using a sword. We also never witness the individual kata through which Tanjiro would have learned the techniques of the Mizuno Koku, the ten water breathing sword forms. The obvious reason being that each technique is to be gradually revealed as the series progresses, so I can't fault the writers for leaving them out of the training episodes. So instead, we get to see Tenjiro swing his sword. A lot. This is a practice called Suburi. Suburi, literally naked swing, has been a staple of kendo pedagogy since the post-war era, but according to an article by George McCall of Kenshi 24-7, actually has little historical precedence before this period. As such, you will find that the majority of mangaka, writers, and animators' frame of reference for Japanese sword arts are rooted in their experiences or understanding of kendo and not kenjutsu. I can't imagine anyone who has watched anime involving swords in some capacity hasn't come across a depiction of Suburi, so it isn't as if Demon Slayer is unique in doing this. It's also really easy to animate a character doing a relatively static motion. Uh, for example, the most basic suburi involves simply swinging the bokto or shinai without moving the feet, rather than more complex movement sets. You save the budget for the action set pieces. Repetitive motion drills, or in the context of kenjutsu, kata, are the fundamental basis of learning how to use a sword. There is a considerable degree of confusion among the general public, and even among martial artists, about what the purpose of kata is. Often, the movement set is seen as if it is patterned on fighting imaginary opponents, to which the realist martial artist scoffs. How useless would such a specific movement set be? What utility is there in training what would require an individual or multiple opponents to attack or react in a very specific way, in precise order, while perfectly timing one's own movements. This isn't martial arts, it's fight choreography, or even worse, dancing. Except, of course, this isn't what pattern practice is meant to do. At all. Two basic goals are achieved through repetitive motion drills. The first is developing the necessary physicality to reliably and consistently perform a technique. This ties back into the pedagogical basis of Subiri, Repeating the same motion over and over again works the necessary muscles to condition the body and acclimate it to an otherwise unnatural movement set. Swords are not nearly as heavy as popular media make them out to be. A typical katana would weigh about 900 grams or around 2 pounds. This doesn't sound heavy, but try moving it around for a while and you'll discover just how fatiguing it can be. The second goal is to learn a precise set of movements and how to practically apply them. Proper stance, footwork, cuts, parries, blocks, counters, etc. all form the basis of what can be called technique. When and how to apply any given technique can be learned through working through these motions, but as Carl Friday points out, it would be a mistake to understand kata as a way to respond mechanically to any given technique. Instead, Kata teach the principles of a technique which can then enable the student to apply it practically in an appropriate situation. One of the aspects of studying sword arts which is missing in Tanjiro's training, especially as it relates to Kenjutsu, is the utter absence of paired drills, which is where we will be looking at next. Part 4. Pressure. Tanjiro doesn't actually pressure test his abilities, doesn't spar with anyone else, until one and a half years into his training. This happens when he meets the characters of Sabito and Makomo after repeatedly failing to slice a boulder in half. Sabito and Makomo, as it happens, are both former students of Orokodaki, who had completed his training 
by successfully splitting the boulder in question. Taking a step back for just a moment, six months before this point in time, Orokodaki had informed Tanjiro that he had nothing left to teach him. So since then, Tanjiro has simply continued his training, honing his skills and trying to pass the final test given to him, split the boulder. After failing at this task for so long, Tanjiro had arrived at an impasse and simply could not advance. Not because he didn't have the necessary skills, but rather because this is the limitation of Suburi training alone. You need to actually have opponents who are able to actively resist your techniques to see if they stand up to pressure in order to effectively use a sword. It is at this point that Sabuto appears and proceeds to chide Tanjiro for his failure and then challenges him to fight. Sabito, quite noticeably, is not armed with a katana, but rather with a bokuto, the standard training weapon of all kenjutsu ryuha. Tanjiro was first concerned for Sabito's safety, but quickly comes to understand he is the only one who is at any risk. Because despite one and a half years of the harshest and most intense training he could bear, he cannot come close to striking Sabito. Instead, Tanjiro is knocked senseless, like a complete novice. This is because Sabito, unlike Tanjiro, has both practical experience against resistive opponents and has mastered the core techniques of the Mizuno Kokyu style. Makimo then appears and is instructed by Sabito to watch over him. Tanjiro, upon awakening, does not fall into despair and self-pity, but rather is invigorated to know who it was that just beat him so easily. Thus, is he introduced to these two characters who spend the next six months training him. In traditional Kenjutsu Ryuha, this is accomplished through kata, but unlike Suburi, which is an exercise practiced by an individual, most kata are worked through in pairs called the Uchitachi, that is the initiator, and the Shitachi, that is the retaliator. Uchitachi tend to be the more experienced of the pair, and they attack the Shitachi, who is the junior, and the individual performing the given technique the kata is supposed to be teaching. The inversion of the traditional roles in Kometsu no Yaiba, Tanjiro attacking and Sabito reacting and defeating him, is I suspect mostly owing to the shonen propensity for harsh training. But there may be something more at play here as well. Many Kenjutsu schools, by and large, do not engage in more active levels of pressure testing, what is commonly called sparring, or if they do, it is always as secondary to the pattern practice of working through kata. The pedagogical basis of this argument is that without the seriousness of mind and conscious understanding of the life and death nature of sword arts, something heavily reinforced through repetition of kata, the martial validity of the techniques are subsumed by point scoring and gamesmanship. In other words, you transform the martial art into a combat sport. Admittedly, this is one side of a much more complex set of issues and critiques which has haunted Ryuha and Kendo halls since the Edo period. But since our focus is on the Kenjutsu side of the issue, I will leave it at that. As I alluded to earlier, most Japanese mangaka, writers, animators, and directors' perspectives on sword arts are heavily colored by the sheer ubiquity of kendo. So while tradition dictates that paired pattern practice has been the primary means of training sword fighters since Buge Ryuha began to develop historically, the primacy of active full contact or free sparring is how most audiences and creators have come to believe it was, or ought, to be done. It's also a lot more exciting and entertaining to watch free sparring rather than controlled movement sets, to say nothing of the thematic core of Tanjiro's training which again I'll be getting to in a little bit. Tanjiro spars with Sabito every day while reviewing everything he has learned and discovering the significance of some techniques he had overlooked. On the last day of his training, two years to the day he was accepted as Orokodaki's student, Tanjiro is confronted by Sabito, who for the first time since they have met, now also wields a katana. The bout is over in seconds, and another really refreshing thing about Demon Slayer overall is that there is a good amount of realism in some 
of the combat. Tanjiro successfully slices through Sabuto's mask, defeating him for the very first time. Except shock! It turns out both Sabito and Makomo aren't actually there, and Tanjiro has finally split the boulder. Now, this may be a controversial take, but for the sake of argument, I'm going to treat Sabito and Makomo as figments of Tanjiro's imagination. Consider that neither actually teach him anything new, but rather repeat and reinforce the training he has already received or has rediscovered by reading his journals. He already had everything he needed to succeed. This is something Rokodaki understood a year ago, but Tanjiro lacked a crucial element his teacher could not or would not give him. As it turns out, what Tanjiro really needed to push past his own limitations was a resistive opponent to help him understand their application as combat techniques even if these opponents were specters of his imagination. Well that, and learning how to breathe. Part 5. Breathing Arguably, the most fundamental technique which Tanjiro learns while training under Rokodaki is not how to use a sword, but how to use a special technique called Zen Suchu no Kokyu, or Total Concentration Breathing. This technique allows one to oxygenate every cell in the body, which is supposed to allow for more rapid healing from injuries as well as stabilizing one's energy and spirit. Later on, Tanjiro also learns that it is total concentration breathing, which allows mere humans to match and even surpass the speed and strength of the demons, as the technique increases heart rate and blood circulation, causing the body temperature to spike, making the user as strong as a demon. This isn't how the human circulatory system works. Having a rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, and increased body temperature will not grant one superhuman powers. But what if I told you there is, in fact, a historic and extant element to Kenjutsu which places a special emphasis on breathing techniques? Ki is a term which many aficionados of Japanese martial arts and weebs alike will have some familiarity. But what precisely Ki is, is a fairly complex topic well beyond the scope of this video. Basically, the concept of Ki is rooted in the Qi of Taoist metaphysics, which is held to be the essential or vital energy which animates human life. Without getting too far into the metaphysical or psycho-spiritual, Many Koryu Budo and Buger Yuha have a set of techniques called Kiai Jutsu. Kiai Jutsu is learning how to apply Ki through oneself as well as manipulating the Ki of one's opponent, but from a more practical, physiological standpoint, Kiai Jutsu is predicated on breathing techniques. According to E.J. Harrison, Ki is the potential power which governs the course of human life and the source of energy inherent in the human race. Psychologically, Kyajutsu is the art of concentrating the whole of one's mental energy upon a single object with the determination to achieve or subdue that object. Physically, it is the art of deep and prolonged breathing. For example, one of the more advanced techniques of the Buge Ryuha of Kashima Shinryu involves the concentration of the entire body called Sotai no Shime. This is achieved through both meditative and focused breathing exercises. Now, this is just one technique among many which centers around developing proper and very deep breathing as a means to improve physicality, health, and overall vitality. So while the explanation given in the show eschews the psycho-spiritual aspect which is rooted in Taoist and Sino-Japanese medicine, it is nevertheless based on an often overlooked or unknown aspect of traditional Japanese martial arts. Frankly, I think it's really fascinating that instead of going with the more generalized ki, chi, chakra, or wholly invented explanation for why the Demon Slayer Corps is able to do what they do, the mangaka instead decided to use a real-world, traditional, and extant martial art as the basis for his combat system. Given that each of the sword arts we experience in the series are all referred to as breath styles, I think it shows a lot of foresight and care went into the world-building. 
This is yet another reason why I have little doubt that Orokodaki's Tengu mask was chosen with the folkloric knowledge of the relationship between Tengu and Japanese sword arts in mind. After all, if you're going to fight demons, who else but another monster will be able to teach you how? Part 6. How to Slay a Demon Demons, and the word used in the show is Oni, as we have come to observe through the few episodes thus far, are a natural, or maybe supernatural, predator of humans. They are physiologically stronger than humans, and are thus also able to move incredibly fast. They typically have claws in place of fingernails and sharp teeth designed to tear and consume human flesh, their primary means of sustenance. They are not impervious to injury, but their bodies are capable of very rapid cellular regeneration, and so most wounds, including the dismemberment of limbs, can be healed relatively quickly. The primary means by which demons can be killed are direct exposure to sunlight, the complete destruction of their heads, or the removal of their heads from their bodies with a specially forged sword of the Demon Slayer core, the Nichiren To, or Nichiren Blade. It is worth, if only briefly, discussing the symbolism of the sword. Most obviously the sword, or Nihonto, has primarily been associated with the samurai, but there is an even older association which ties back into the early mythology of Shinto. Much like the Kyu, or bow, which is used as protection against malign supernatural entities since the days of the Nada period, swords were also used in rituals as well as protective talismans to ward off evil. This is an interesting fact because, fundamentally, the demons in the world of Kimetsu no Yaiba do not use weapons in the same way that humans do. Their supernatural speed, strength, and claws are usually enough to hunt, kill, and consume their human prey. However, in addition to their physiology, some demons also possess a individual or unique ability called a blood demon art. Now, the only demon we encounter in these episodes, the Temple Demon, is able to manipulate his hair, but it is unclear if this is in fact a blood demon art or simply an extension of his natural abilities. Thus, some demons also possess items or tools they use in combat, but at least as of the conclusion of the first season, no demon has been shown to use a sword. The way that Tanjiro has learned to use his sword, it's an abnormal way to learn how to use a weapon. Which isn't to say that weapons cannot, and were not, used against unarmed opponents. The historic record is far too full of the mass slaughter of civilian populations to imagine otherwise. No, what I mean is that traditionally, when studying sword arts, and typically any kind of weapon art in general, you learn to use your sword against an armed opponent. Typically, they would be armed with a similar weapon, in this case a sword, but you would also train against a multitude of other weapons, such as spears, staffs, knives, and so on. When it comes to fighting an unarmed opponent, the student would be on the unarmed end, learning how to defend against a weapon when you don't have one. But as I have pointed out, fighting demons is not the same as fighting humans. This can be understood to be one reason, at least from the writer's perspective, to explain why Orokodaki did not use pair drills or pressure testing to teach Tenjiro Kenjutsu. In fact, the only time we see Orokodaki and Tenjiro spar, Orokodaki is unarmed, and thus mimicking the demons Tenjiro is likely to face while teaching him how to properly break fall and recover from being thrown. Fundamentally, the opponents Tenjiro would most be likely to face would not be wielding swords. Thus, Tanjiro spending his time conditioning his body to take the kind of punishment he would receive while fighting demons, coupled with the honing of his naturally heightened sense of smell, mastering the ten water breathing forms, and grasping the basics of total concentration breathing, provides the unique set of skills to allow him to take the final examination to become a member of the Demon Slayer core. And we, as the viewer, are with Tanjiro every step of the way. Part 7 Empathy One of the first criticisms I ever encountered regarding Demon Slayer 
was about the utter tedium of Tanjiro's initial period of training. This is a criticism which I can absolutely understand. Front-loading a new series with an immediate slowdown of the narrative to a snail's pace, especially after the frenetic events of the first episode, will turn people off. According to stats on my anime list, 1.56% of their users dropped the series before completion. Now, given the prevalence of the three-episode rule, I would not find it hard to believe that many seasonal viewers simply drop the show after the third episode. With an ever-increasing volume of seasonal streaming series, not wanting to waste one's limited consumption time on something that failed to grab and hold their attention is absolutely understandable. For myself, though, I experience something completely different. I believe this is primarily owing to something which sets me apart from the majority of viewers watching Kimetsu no Yaiba. I studied the Blade. I mentioned in the intro that one of the most central elements of shonen battle manga and anime was the main character going through intense sessions of training, watching a plucky but weak underdog, outcast, or overconfident protagonist recognize their own failings and quickly transitioning to a burning passion for self-improvement is shown in 101. Well, as I discussed in part 2, in Kenjutsu, sword arts and many traditional martial arts, training through the repetition of a given movement set, kata, or drills, is a core pedagogical principle. This all but necessitates hours and hours of an individual or pairs of students' time spent working through these movement sets. This can be incredibly tedious to perform, so imagine being an observer who is watching this take place. For most people, I imagine any novelty wears off quite rapidly and one would simply lose interest. So how do you reconcile the necessary tedium of repetitive drill training with the needs of a piece of media to be engaging and entertaining? You use a montage. While it is true that Kimetsu no Yaiba does make use of montage, these tend to be restricted to showing Tanjiro repeating some element of training he has already accomplished. Instead, we the viewing audience spend one and a third total episodes with Tanjiro as he trains. Rather than simply watch his progress happen in the span of one or two minutes of intense physical and mental exertion, we spend 30. Narratively, it takes Tanjiro two years from being accepted as a Rokodaki student to finally being able to slice the boulder. Two years. The way the passage of time is framed is really clever. Tanjiro records his training and experience in a set of journals. But the journals are not for him, although he does later on return to them for review. Rather, he is writing them for someone else, his sister. Nezuko, who conveniently decides to hibernate during all this time, is thus wholly unaware of what Tanjiro goes through in order to begin his quest to change her back into a human. This hammers home an important thematic element at this point in the narrative. Tanjiro is alone. Sure, Orogodaki is there and interacts with him, but outside of a few scenes needed for training purposes, Tanjiro spends almost all of his time on screen by himself, climbing up and down the mountain, practicing suburi, trying to cut the boulder. Even when he finally encounters Sabito and Makomo in the final six months of his training, they aren't really there. Up to the massacre of his family, Tanjiro had always been surrounded by them, the people most close to him, but they are gone. And yes, Nezuko is still with him, but she's now a demon in a coma. And so, for the first time in his young life, Tanjiro is really, truly alone. Except for us. I said that I interpreted the immediate slowdown of the narrative a bit differently than other weebs I talked with the show about, and I attributed this to my own experience as someone who practices a sword art. I understand the banality and weariness which can result from repetitive motion drills. I don't practice kenjutsu, but the sword arts I do study also revolve around single and paired repetitive motion drills. The pedagogical significance of these drills manifests itself in what has come to be called embodied knowledge. Reading a book, understanding the biomechanical reasoning, and being taught how to perform a given technique 
will only ever get you so far, because that will remain an intellectual exercise. In order for something to transition to embodied knowledge, you have to actually perform the action, over and over and over again, until you feel it, know it, and understand how to apply it under pressure. These kind of skills can of course be taught, but at the fundamental level, they need to be learned. And so, I actually found solace and enjoyment in the tedium over the course of the two episodes. Here at last was a shonen which didn't simply use montage to gloss over the struggle and the monotony of training in sword arts. It did its best to convey this feeling through the deliberate slowdown of the story, and that is something which I really appreciated. But I'm not the target audience. While sword arts, at least outside Japan, are becoming slightly more popular than they have been for decades, the pool of practitioners is nevertheless relatively small. I dare say the vast majority of the audience wouldn't have had much exposure to the practice of sword arts outside any kendo lessons they may have had, so clearly, there must be some other reason, some other basis upon which to slow down the narrative and have our protagonist spend two years depicted over 30 minutes training. And there is. It's empathy. Just after Urokodaki meets and first speaks with Tanjiro, after the ordeal with the temple demon, when Tanjiro was trying to figure out what to do next, he has an inner monologue in which he proclaims that this boy is too kind and incapable of making decisions, and is simply not cut out to be a demon slayer. We know that Tanjiro is reluctant to kill the demon, but when he is informed that the small knife he has won't do it, he tries to find the most humane way of carrying out this grim task. As the story progresses, we will come to understand Tanjiro's defining characteristic is not his determination, his skill with a sword, or even his superior olfactory sense, but his ability to empathize with others. Tanjiro was not born a warrior, there is no narrative hints that his family were Shizoku, the class in Japan made up of former samurai, or that he had any dreams of seeking out any kind of adventure. He was simply a committed son and member of his family, who love to see them happy. When his family is murdered, his primary goal is not to avenge them, but rather to change his only living relative back into a human being. It just so happens that the path of a demon slayer is the best chance he has to accomplish this. And so gentle, kind Tanjiro spends two grueling years of his life learning how to kill. But through it all, through the exhaustion, the grueling monotony, and the utter isolation of this ascetic training regimen, Tanjiro does not lose his ability to empathize. And we are there. We share, if only a little, in the pain and tedium, in the grueling snail's pace of plot advancement, in the banality of his training, in the countless metaphorical walls he runs up against, the pit of despair in the face of seemingly no progress until, right at the very end, we also share in his victory. Through this, we come to understand Tanjiro, and we see him emerge stronger, but no less full of compassion and kindness for it. And as Tanjiro continues on his journey to become a demon slayer, even when he carries out his duty to kill demons, creatures which have ruined not only his life, but the lives of countless others over the span of centuries, he is able to see past this, to their previous lives, when they too were human. And this is the very heart of Kimetsu no Yaiba. Because if Tanjiro is unable to see the person, the human being buried under the fangs and claws, hidden behind the terror and horror that demons inflict, then what hope would there be for Nesco? Conclusion as I stated in the intro, Kimetsu no Yaiba is, for its relative length, full of interesting and heavily stylized representations of sword fighting, and episodes 2 and 3 are not close to the totality of episodes centered on training in the first season. So I doubt this will be the last time we'll be talking about Demon Slayer. My hope is that you've been able to take something away from this video, and what Kimetsu no Yaiba can teach us about sword fighting. If you are interested in exploring Kenjutsu, or the history of Japanese sword arts, I always post the sources I use in the video description. I hope you enjoyed this video. 
As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you like the video and think it is merited, please give it a thumbs up. Likewise, if you dislike the video, please show your displeasure by downvoting. If you think anyone you know may enjoy the video, please share it. It certainly helps out the channel. Finally, if you really like the video and want to see what else I've done, subscribe or check out these links. Thanks for your time.